I want to share a message with you this morning that I've given the title, The Great Exchange. The Great Exchange. From Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 10. Before I read, I'm going to pray one more time. Lord, we thank you so much, God, for your living word. Lord Jesus, the, the words that you said always come to my heart before I, I get ready to share your word. And you said, Jesus, that flesh profits nothing. I thank you this morning, God, that there's nothing that I can do on my own. But I thank you that you said that the words you speak are spirit and they are life. Lord, I find rest this morning in the fact that your word is able to prosper and do everything that you sent it forth to do, God. It never returns to you void. Your word, God, gives us life. And I pray this morning, God, as we look into your word, that you would do what only you can. And you would bring forth life in this place, in our hearts. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor has taught him. With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him? And taught him in the path of justice. Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by <coughs> him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold. And the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither. And the whirlwind will take them away like stone. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. And my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. This word is given to the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. Years before they would go into Babylonian captivity. 
The reason they went into Babylonian captivity is because time and time again, they worshipped other gods and forsook the Lord. And here is God's word going out to them before they ever get into that condition. And he is reminding them of who he is and that nothing or no one compares to him and that their idols that they have made for themselves are worthless and useless. That nations are nothing to God. That, that God is sovereign Lord of the universe who sits above the circle of the earth, who, who measures the span of the heavens with his hand. He calls himself in these scriptures the Holy One, the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator. It's always important to note the names that God gives himself as he's speaking to us. He gives himself the names here, the Holy One, the Everlasting God, the Lord, and the Creator. He wants the people to know that he is holy, that there is nothing or no one that compares to him. There is nothing they could create. There is nothing they could seek in this world that would ever measure up to who he is and what he's like. Who will you liken me to, he says? Who will you compare me to? He says he's the everlasting God. You see, they were creating for themselves idols. Idols of silver. He says here in the scriptures, idols of wood. These things will not last. These things you can create with your hands. Man can make them. And they will not last. He says here that he is the Lord. When he uses the name of the Lord, he's reminding them of who he is and who he's been of old. He was first revealed to the people of Israel as the Lord through Moses. When Moses was out in the wilderness for 40 years and God appeared to him there in the burning bush. And Moses drew near to see. And God began to speak to him, reveal himself to him and say that he had heard the people's cries and he was going to deliver them through sending Moses to them. And Moses says, but who will I tell them to sent me? He said, he said to Moses, you tell them I am. The Lord has sent you. I am. He's the Lord. He is everything. He is everything that we need. Nothing or no one compares to him. He's the Lord that delivered them from the bondage of the Egyptians. Part of the Red Sea. He's the Lord that fed them manna from heaven. That led them every day with a cloud covering them in the heat. Shading them and protecting them. And a fire by night to give them warmth and to fend off any animals that would try to attack them at night. He was the Lord that led them every step of the way for 40 years. Their clothes didn't even wear out. It was the Lord who had sustained them. God is reminding the people who he is and who he's been and who he will be. He never changes. He says that he is the creator. God is the one who gave them life in the first place. God is the one who established the earth and everything that we see and all that we have. It all come from the creator, God. Man, man cannot create. We can only take things that God has created do something with them. And the Bible says that what flesh does, what man does, is it corrupts. It only produces corruption. Man produces things like false idols, false gods, things that we create for ourselves, that we try to find our life in instead of God. So God is reminding them that he is the Holy One. Nothing or no one compares to him. He is the everlasting God. Their idols are all going to uh, fade away one day. They will not last, but he's the everlasting God. He's the Lord. He is everything we need. The one who cares for us, sustains us, delivers us. He is the creator. He's the very one who gives us life. He's showing the people that they have Forsaking him for things that won't last. They are forsaking him for things that can't compare. Forsaking him for things that can never, ever compete with who he is. The Bible says in Jeremiah 2, 11 through 13, it says, Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God 
for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And they have dug for themselves. That is to create. They've created something themselves. Crack cisterns that can hold no water at all. You see, anything that we begin to seek or pursue other than God is an idol. It is something we have created for ourselves. It is something we have created that God says is just a broken cistern. It cannot hold any water. It cannot give us life. He says, he says that they have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. In Jeremiah 2, 5, he says, what did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worship worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. Lord, help me to relate this to you because this is something that burns in my heart. I, sometimes I find myself straying away and beginning to focus on something as a priority other than God being first. And my loving God who saved me, who, who died for me on the cross, who, who created me, who I'm, he's the only reason that I even exist or have breath in my lungs, I can sometimes hear him whisper to my heart, what did you find wrong with me? What did you see wrong with me that you think you need something else? Have you ever felt like, and God cannot be compared to our human experience, but have you ever felt like you have loved someone and given someone all that you have to offer only for them to not love you back, to not appreciate you for who you are and how you love them? Do you see that God, his heart here, he's saying, what did you find wrong with me? I, I delivered you. I, I chose you when you were not a people. I, I made you my very own people. I, I give you land. I, I brought you out of bondage. I led you. I fed you. I cared for you. And yet you continue to leave me for other things, to forsake me, to exchange your glorious God for worthless idols. And even then, even though God has treated them with such love and mercy and grace, and the people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols, I want you to see in the scriptures that God is still offering himself to them. In verse 27, he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, shall renew their strength. You see, they have given themselves over to idols, to things they have created for themselves, to worship them above God. And they have still found themselves weak. They have still found themselves empty. And then they even have the audacity to look to God and say, God, you've overlooked us. God, you don't see us where we are says, how could you say such a thing? Have you not known? Have you not heard? I'm the everlasting God. I'm the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, and I don't faint or get weary. My understanding is unsearchable, and me, the Holy One, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, I give strength to the weak, power to those who are helpless. This word give, it means to a hand-to-hand -hand exchange or personally deliver. It's a personal thing. And God says, 
I am the holy God, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, and I hand-to-hand -hand exchange my power for your weakness. To those who would come to me, to those who would seek me instead of other idols, to those who wait upon the Lord, he gives strength, he gives life, he sustains those who come to him. He offers his power in exchange for our weakness. In Isaiah 57, 14 and 15, the Bible says, And one shall say, Heap it up, heap it up. Prepare the way. Take the stumbling block out of the way for my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Yes, this holy God, this high and holy one who is unapproachable in his holiness. He says, I come near to those who are broken and humble. To those who are willing to recognize that they need me. The Holy One draws near. He dwells with those who have a contrite and humble spirit. How did the Holy One, the Creator, the Lord, the everlasting God, come to sinful man to dwell with us? He came to us through Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. This whole thing here in Isaiah chapter 40, when he talks about it starting in verse 10, the Lord has come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. All of this is speaking of Jesus who has the strong arm. The one who was mighty in battle. The one who won the victory on the cross. To make a way for holy God to be reconciled to sinful man. That's how the high and holy one, the lofty one who inhabits eternity, now dwells with those who are contrite and humble. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This morning, if you've never known the Lord at all, I don't have to ask you this morning. I know that you are heavy laden. And the Holy One, who no one can be compared to, the everlasting God who never faints or is weary. The Lord, the one who delivers and provides and sustains. He has extended himself to you in the person of Jesus Christ. Offering you rest for your weary soul. The high and holy one has come to us through his son, Jesus Christ. If you've never known him, that invitation is for him. And for us Christians this morning. I mean, you know, even as Christians, we still get weary and heavy laden. Sometimes we try to carry things that we should not carry. Sometimes we try to do things without God. Sometimes we stray away and begin to focus on other gods. And we make idols in our lives and we forsake our Lord. And where do we find ourselves again? Weary. All we have to do is come back to the same place. It's Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is how the high and holy one comes to us. Jesus is the one that we come to when we are, are heavy laden and, and brought down by, by heaviness. And we're tired and can't go anymore. Jesus is the one who gives us rest and strength. In Psalm 103, 13 through 15. It says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, the wildflowers we bloom and die. You see, the Bible said here in Isaiah 40, 
It says he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. It doesn't matter how young or how old. Human beings get tired. We cannot go on our own. We need God. And God knows how weak we are. And He's tender and compassionate to those who fear Him. He understands us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses. The High and Holy One became a man. And he walked a mile in our shoes. He knows what it's like to get up every day and live in this world. He knows what it's like. He knows the things that can drag you down, the things that you face every single day. And the Bible says that we can come to Him and we can find grace to help us in our time of need. We can come to Jesus. He offers His power in exchange for our weakness. Now the exchange requires a couple of things from us. If you're going to exchange something with somebody, right? It's somebody giving you something and you giving them something. There's a, it's, it takes both sides, amen? So the exchange requires some things of us. God offers his power in exchange for our weakness. But the exchange requires us to believe. It requires us to believe. In Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, as Paul is praying a prayer for the church, for those who were believers, who were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, he has just said. They have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Yet Paul is praying for those believers that they might know something, that the eyes of their hearts might be enlightened, that they might see and understand some certain truth. What is it? One of them is in verses 19 and 20. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. For us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Do you remember the woman who had the issue of blood? She had went to every human doctor she could find. She spent all of her power, all of her wealth, all of her resources and everything man could do, and she didn't get any better. She got worse. The Bible says that she was like this for 13 years. Just think with me. She had been bleeding for 13 years. Can you imagine how weak this woman was? This was literally a matter of life and death. If she did not find an answer to this problem, she couldn't live like this forever. This woman was desperate. She did everything that she could. She went to the world. She went to her own resources. And she could not find a cure. And it says, when she heard about Jesus, she said within herself, if I can just touch him, I'll be made. And the Bible says she pressed through the crowd and she touched the hem of his garment. And when she did, it says that Jesus felt power flow from him. It was in the exchange when she brought her weakness to his power that she exchanged her weakness for his power. The Apostle Paul is praying for us as believers he says, I pray that God will turn the light bulb on, that you'll see what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards those who believe. We as Christians, we have access to the very life of God inside of us. We have access to the power of God living on the inside of this weak flesh. In these conditions in this world where we cannot handle it on our own. And when others cannot seem to put one foot in front of the other or able to overcome, Christians are supposed to be those who overcome. The Bible says that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 
Not trusting in ourselves. That's the opposite of faith. But our dependence upon God is what gives us power that this world knows nothing about. He says, I pray that God will open your eyes to see the power that is for you who believe. You know, I think sometimes it's kind of like having a whole bunch of money in your pocket and you didn't even know it was there. It's like having resources that you never use or you never spend. I fear sometimes as believers, we see ourselves unlike God sees us. We see ourselves as weak when we have access to so much more. And we live beneath what is actually possible if we would believe and trust God. It says in Romans 8, 11, it says, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life. There's the exchange. Give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. I'm talking about the Holy One. I'm talking about the everlasting God. I'm talking about the one who never gets tired or weak, whose understanding is unsearchable, who sits above the circle of the earth, who raises the dead to life. He lives inside of you. Do you see? He gives life to our mortal, weak bodies. Yes, we are weak. Yes, we have the ability to fail. But sometimes we magnify our weakness instead of magnifying his power. See, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We need to see it from faith's point of view, from God's point of view. The Spirit of God lives inside of me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10, Paul says we have this treasure. It's speaking of the Spirit of God, the life of Christ in us. We have this treasure in earth and weak vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Apostle Paul is saying, look, these bodies, these weak vessels that we have, they are being pushed beyond its limits, but we keep going. How do we do it? It's because the power is not of us. It is of God. And see, the world sees that. You see, he says now the life of Christ is being manifested. It's being seen and known and demonstrated. You see, when they whooped Paul 49 times and threw him in prison, stoned him and left him for dead, when he was shipwrecked, when he was hungry, when he went through all of these things, but he kept getting up and he kept going. People saw the life of Christ in the man. Enabling him, giving him power to endure, power to continue on when somebody shouldn't be able to take that much. Paul was able to keep going because of the power of Christ, the life of Christ inside of him. In Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. Ephesians 3, 14 through 20. In verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul again praying another prayer in Ephesians for the church. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That, here's the prayer, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, listen, through faith. Through faith. That Christ would live. That I would be strengthened on the inside through faith, through believing. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. How is he going to do it? According to the power 
that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. My God, the church needs revival. If we're not seeing this, if this is not something that the church is known for, if the church does not have power, we need revival. And he offers it to us. There is, a, there is an offer extended to us, his power for our weakness. But this exchange requires us to believe. Requires us to come to him in utter dependence upon his power and not ours. Not only does the exchange require us to believe, it requires us to receive. The Bible says in Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You see, Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem, to tarry there, until they were endued with power from on high. They could not be what they were called to be without the Spirit of God living inside of them. The power of God enabling them to be witnesses. And Jesus said in Acts 1, he said, you shall receive this power. You shall receive. This word receive, it means to take with the hand and receive what is offered. Now let's back up. Y'all stick with me. I know I've been talking a long time. But do you remember what gives means? It means a hand to ex a hand to hand exchange or personal uh, delivery. So God is He gives power to the weak. Okay, a hand to hand exchange. Okay, but we receive. Receive means to take with the hand and receive what is offered. So God is extending His hand to give us power. It's there. It's available. But we must receive. We must receive what God. Has offered us in Christ. Yesterday we had Brady's birthday party. And I can't hardly walk around much. Y'all haven't seen me jumping around because I am sore. Man, I, I got muscle in my legs and stomach. I didn't know that I was using yesterday, but I know now I'm sore. But I shoot all those jelly balls out and I run out. Well, I'd run out, I wouldn't have no power left. And the only way I could get refilled. Come on, stick with me. Is I had to go over to the table with the man who had the jelly balls. Because I didn't have them. He did. But he had them ready. He had his hand extended, ready to give them to anybody who would come and receive them. So I had to go to that table, get filled back up on the jelly balls. Listen, I'm not teaching you this morning that you need to pray a prayer to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit or some sort of second work of God. When you receive Christ, you receive everything. The Bible says we are complete in Him, lacking nothing. The Bible says that Jesus is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Ghost, immerse us in the Spirit of God, and that happens the time that you yielded yourself and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you were born of God's Spirit and filled with God's Spirit, you were immersed into God. And you were given everything that you needed right then in Christ. The Bible also teaches us even as born again, filled with the Spirit of God, believers, we oftentimes have to continually come to God in our weakness and be renewed in our strength. The word in Ephesians 5, when Paul talks about be filled with the Spirit, it means an ongoing experience. It says be being filled. It's a continual thing that we must continually, and, and what this is about is not some weird or spooky or mystical experience. What I'm talking about is fellowship with God. Be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is not a power. The Spirit is a person. And so God has so designed it that even as believers, we must come to Him relationally, continually dependent upon Him. See, God wants us to have to come back to Him and realize that we can't do it without Him. He wants us. He says that I'm the vine and you're the branch and apart from me, you can't do anything. The moment we begin to try to function apart from Christ, we sense our weakness. We must come back to Him for the power that we so desperately need. 
we receive this power. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul, who we know was filled with the Spirit of God, baptized with the Spirit of God, had everything he needs in Christ. Yet here in chapter 12, this man, this great man of God, finds himself needing power. He says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Listen to me closely. God knows exactly what to allow in your life to keep you humble and dependent upon Him. It says a thorn was given to Him. Do you understand this was grace? This was a blessing from God because without this thorn, Paul would have got prideful. He'd have got to a place to where he didn't need God and he wouldn't have stayed humble. He says, it's the whole reason I got the thorn is so I would not exalt myself above measure. So he says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. It's okay to go to God and complain about your thorn. It's okay to ask him to take it away. Paul did it. He, he cried out to God three times. He said, Lord, take this thing out of my life. Listen, that's when God spoke back to him and gave him a revelation. He says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, Paul, is made perfect in your weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And now Paul sees the whole thing differently. He says, therefore. Most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities or my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, in order to receive this exchange, God offering his power in exchange for our weakness. We must have a weakness. We must have a need to come to God. And God oftentimes allows things in our lives to bring us to a place to where we are just like Paul did. We will begin to cry out to him in prayer. We will begin to seek him with all of our hearts because this thing's too much for us to handle. And it's in that place that God speaks to our souls and makes us realize I got grace for you. I got strength for you. I got something supernatural that you, if you will receive it, will be able to endure any thorn, any problem that you encounter. Not by your strength, but by my power. You see, we must be humble and dependent upon the Lord to receive from Him. The prideful, self-sufficient man cannot receive anything from God. Let me say it again. Prideful, self-sufficient people cannot receive anything from God. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 7, it says, But clothe, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Let me stop right here for a second. In due time. You see, the problem is many times we want it on our time. I believe in verse 27 of Isaiah 40 that that's why the people were saying what they said. It says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My just claim is passed over or ignored by God. See, sometimes when things aren't changing right away, we begin to think that God is ignoring us, that God does not see us. And we do not wait upon the Lord in humility, but we take things in our own hands in pride and we try to work it out ourselves. Or we try to find something else that will give us strength, something else that will give us life, something else that will sustain us instead of waiting on the Lord and in His time for Him to strengthen us and help us and give us what we need. He says, casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. There again is the exchange. See, here I come with all of my weakness, all of my cares, all of my fears, all of my anxieties, all of my problems. This is all I have to bring. But God says, that's what I want. You bring me all of that mess. Cast it on me. And that's when I'll give to you the power that you need to free you from the anxieties, to free you from the fears, to free you from the troubles, to free you from the things that, that you can't face on your own. 
And Isaiah 30, 15 through 19, and I'm wrapping it up, says this is what the Sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel says. Only in returning to me and resting in me. Come on, somebody needs to hear that this morning. Two R's. Just If you don't hear anything else this morning, come on, Christian, here it is. Return to him and rest in him. These should be two words that we continually exercise in our relationship with God. Return to Him, rest in Him. God gives us power. We go out. And we must every day return to Him, rest in Him. It says, in quietness and confidence is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will get our help from Egypt. See, we won't wait on the Lord. We'll go make it happen ourselves. He says, they will give us swift horses for riding into battle, but the only swiftness you're going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. One of them will chase a thousand of you. Five of them will make all of you flee. You will be left like a lonely flagpole on a hill or a tattered banner on a distant mountaintop. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. He will be gracious if you will ask for help. Listen, God is just waiting on you to stop trying to make things happen yourself and do it on your own. You're not waiting on God. He's not looking over you or ignoring you. He's waiting on you to stop. To let it go. To put it down. To come to Him in weakness and say, God, I can't do it. And I will wait on you. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. As long as you're still trying to do it on your own, God, resist the proud. He resists the proud, the self-sufficient one. But He gives grace to the humble. He's waiting on you to ask. Come on, how many times do you get up of a day and just run out and face a day without waiting on the Lord? And no wonder we're overcome. No wonder one thing upon another just begins to defeat us and keep us down so quickly. And every day it maps up and it seems that we can go shorter and shorter amounts of time with peace. Shorter and more, shorter amounts of time of victory and being able to overcome. Why? Because we're not waiting on the Lord. Trying to do things on our own. I'll give you this illustration and I'm done. On the way here this morning, the reason I went in my office instead of going to Sunday school like I normally do is the Lord, on the way here, I just kept feeling like the Lord wanted to tell me one more thing. I hadn't got everything He had to say to me about the message this morning. So it worked out. Uh, Michelle, he stopped me, had to say something to me. And then that just led to one thing or another. I was able to, I knew I could go to my office and and I needed to take the time back there, and I did. And as I sat back there, the Lord began to speak to me about the difference between a motorboat and a sailboat. Now, just stick with me a second. A person with a boat that has a motor, they don't wait on nobody. They put that boat in the water, they crank that thing up, and they go where they want to. There's some people who are motorboat people, and there's some people who are sailboat. Sailboat people, they, they're not crazy about their motorboat. They know them things that go fast and do things that that sailboat can't do. But you know what they like? They like putting that boat in the water and saying, Lord, if you see in the wind, we'll go somewhere. If you don't, we'll sit right here. See, a sailboat person has to depend upon the wind. It can't go anywhere without the wind helping them. We need to be a people that say, Lord, I can't do nothing without you. My motor is not an everlasting motor. I found out, Lord, that that thing breaks down on me. I got trouble with it. I spend more time working on my motor than I am getting anything done. And, Lord, I just can't get it to work no more. I need a sailboat. Give me a sail. I throw down my efforts and my ability to push my own boat somewhere. And I depend on you, Lord. If you send the wind, we'll move. If not, we'll stay right here. Whatever you want, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Amen. Amen.